Okay, I think we're live, so that's good news all around. I hope everybody's well. Uh, welcome to our CMAP bootcamp uh, live stream, equity release live stream as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, good to go for a lovely day here in Cheltenham. It's the uh, start of the summer, I guess, although the summer probably started about a month ago, but we won't worry about that too much. We've got some, uh, some good stuff for you today on um, CMAP and equity release. By the way, we're putting out our new equity release product later this week, early next week. So really, we're really excited about that because equity release is such a massive growth area. What's been happening in the news? Well, a lot's been going on in the news. We've got our new uh, prime minister being voted in, I guess voted, it's not really democracy, is it, in the next couple of days. There's talk of uh, Brexit, of course, no deals. There's all sorts of things going on. Chancellor of the Exchequer is looking as though he's going to resign if Boris gets in. It's all happening, isn't it? But um, meanwhile, of course, the uh, the mortgage market, the industry goes on. Lots going on, of course, with, with the marketplace. And I want to talk about a few questions I've got planned for you. As always, if you want to, you can ask questions, but you don't have to. You can just listen and enjoy. Quite a short one for you today. A um, couple of topics, really. The first topic is um, always a topical one for questions in both exams for the CMAP and the equity release, and that's stamp duty. <laughs> yeah, hi, welcome. Let's take a look at, um, or have a re-look at stamp duty, because, you know, it's one of those things that uh, started off quite, quite simple, really, stamp duty. And we're talking here about uh, stamp duty land tax, you know, stamp duty land tax, which is, uh, well, we call it stamp duty, don't we? And I'm, I'm focusing this one, really, on the equity release market. But um, any, any topic here, of course, <coughs> me, relates to all areas of, of stamp duty, not just equity release. It's, uh, it used to be a really simple one, stamp duty. And back in the day, when uh, back in the sort of 90s, um, it was 1% of the purchase price of a property, and that was it. You know, it was a really easy thing to calculate. Now, of course, they've made it very complicated, and there's loads of exceptions as well. So I want to talk about a particular cases that affect equity release, uh, stamp duty that affects equity release, really. A huge amount of money is coming in now via stamp duty. People don't appreciate what George Osborne did when he changed it, particularly the, the plus 3% for second properties. The, the figures for 2018, so, um, you know, it depends when you're watching this video, of course, depends how, how late is that is, uh, the HMRC bought in 10 billion. There you go. £10 billion pounds in, in stamp duty land tax, which is an awful lot of money compared to some of the other taxes. It dwarfs it. So it's a very, very popular tax as far as HMRC are concerned. It has been criticised as being a dampener, really, for, for the housing market. Now, I, I, I paid 20 grand last year on the bond, this year on the property that I bought. 20 grand. It's a lot of money, isn't it? OK, let's get into the equity release kind of world then when it comes to stamp duty. Well, first of all, then, with equity release, of course, people often um, uh, release capital from their property. That capital is given to them tax-free. They can do what they like with it. And some people like to buy a second home. So, of course, if it's a second property, um, as we can appreciate, of course, if it's a second property, then you have to pay plus 3% stamp duty, which is uh, just one of those things. Now, not a lot of people are aware of this, but if the property is less than 40 grand, now that doesn't count. So, um, okay, it depends which part of the country you're buying in. Um, if you're buying a second property down on the coast, I don't know, anywhere around the country is probably more than 40 grand for a nice property. But that's, uh, that, that's been known for quite a while as well, isn't it? Now, with um, stamp duty as well, with equity release, you have what's called home reversion plans. Now, remember, a home reversion plan is not like a lifetime mortgage, really. A home reversion plan is where the company, or the home reversion company, yeah, put that in there for you, usually a life insurance company or some other kind of company, buys the property from you effectively. So that usually it's 100% reversion, it can be less. They buy, buy the property from you, you then become a leaseholder on that property for a long, long time until you die or go into home or care. And um, they own it. So of course, they have to pay stamp duty on that um, transfer. So stamp duty land tax is payable when they buy it, because effectively they're buying the property. You become a tenant or a leasehold tenant in that property. You don't own it anymore. Now, very, very few, if any, home reversion plans are ever arranged by financial advisors. Uh, that's probably one of the reasons why at the end of the day. That's fair, fair and dandy, isn't it? Okay, another reason people take out, um, take out 
equity release is in the form of bridging, and it's quite possible for you to do a bridge based on, upon that. So let's just take a look at a typical bridging scenario. You've got your property which you're trying to sell. Uh, this one's up on the market, you know, for selling. And you found a, a glorious property that you want to buy. It's put a little glorious property, a couple of chimney stacks in there as well. And you know, great big front door. You, you found this property that you want to purchase. And obviously in the normal situation, you sell that house, buy that house. That's normally what happens, of course. That's where you get chains, don't you? But of course, bridging is slightly different. Bridging is where you uh, want to buy the second house before you sold the first house. There's different types of bridging going on and we're totally okay with that. But the point here is that if you decide to bridge, you could do equity release on your existing property. So for example, that existing property was worth a certain, you know, quite a lot of money. You could uh, release some equity from that and that equity release, if you like, there you go, could then be used to, to bridge the second property. Now, the detail of that you can have a look at on another video, but the point here is that you are buying another property and the revenue regards you as buying a second property. That's the key thing here. So you'll have to pay plus 3% stamp duty land tax on that because effectively it's a second property. Although it's your main residence, and that's your main residence, you're buying a second property. And a lot of people get really upset about that. But the point here is though, is you can apply for a refund if you're able to sell this property within three years. So if you could get that house sold within three years, you can then apply for a refund of your sent duty because obviously you're buying a main residence, not, not a second property. So that's something else that affects bridging or, or, or equity release as well. Now the other thing about equity release you'll be careful of, uh, particularly when it comes to home reversion plans, is you have corporates who get involved here, particularly with the home reversion plans. Now corporates get caught in different types of stamp duty. Now there's, uh, there's two types really, or, or they collectively call it ATED. Have you come across that phrase before? I have to put that in there for you, ATED. You might have read about it, I wouldn't worry too much about it. It stands for Annual Tax on Enveloped Dwellings. That's a phrase for you, isn't it? But you'll never see it called that, it's always called ATED. And the whole point is that if you're a corporate entity and you buy a residential property of more than um, half a million in this country, you could be charged ATED. Now, ATED is an annual tax, which is bad news all around, of course, but it also means that you have to pay 15% stamp duty land tax. And nobody wants to pay that, especially a corporate. And that's pretty bad at the end of the day. Now, since 2016, though, there has been that relief against this. And um, uh, equity release is, is uh, exempt from ATED, effectively. If the purpose of the purchase of the property from the home reversion company is for equity release purposes, and that when they come to sell the property, when the person's died and gone into care home, and when they come to sell the property, if it's sold without any undue delay or inconvenience, then that company is exempt from ATED and the 15% stamp duty. So that's good news all around if you are a home reversion company. So what I'm saying there is that so now you're exempt from ATED if you are you know, doing a, an equity lease. So that's something to think about as well. Um, interestingly enough, if you're an SPV and you're buying a buy-to-let property, a lot of buy-to-let properties, of course, being purchased by limited companies now for the tax benefits. If you're buying a, you know, for, for rental, again, you're exempt from ATED as well, if, you know, if you're buying a property for rent. So this extra 15% and the uh, annual tax, you're exempt from. So you might come across that somewhere in your reading and wonder what ATED was. You probably thought it was a financial conduct authority rule, like a, an NCOB or an ICOB or something like that. But it's not. So that's stamp duty, really. Um, Couple of things that crop up in questions. This 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 refund business comes up quite a lot as well. I've seen that one a lot. And the bridging one, of course, is something to think about. So that's been an update for you on stamp duty. Bye. There we go. So a nice little video for you on ATED and stamp duty and all those good things. I'm going to quick drink of my cup of tea. Hmm. I'll show you it's live as well. Yeah, it's all happening in the news at the moment, isn't it? It's all happening in the news at the moment. I was reading about the, the property market, of course, and the property market is very much in the doldrums at the moment. There's very little property on the market to buy, and in fact, a lot of purchasers now are holding off buying. I've also noticed that there's not a lot of letting going on either. So a lot of people are just sitting still waiting to see what's going to happen, which could produce you know, a great big boom come next year, which, which could also, of course, 
head into some kind of property slump. But um, it's, um, it's a bit worrying, really, what's going on. If I were you in the mortgage business, I would look for ways of diversifying your, your income. I'd definitely be doing that. Definitely looking at uh, the equity release, which we talked about as well before. Let's get on to another subject for you. Yeah, hi. Let's take a look at um, welfare benefits. And it's, it's, a, it's a law, if you like, or, or a welfare benefit called universal credit, which a lot of people get really confused about. And the problem with universal credit, if there is a problem, of course, is it's been around since 2011. It was first mooted. They're still not quite with us yet. So it's taken, you know, almost 10 years to get to grips with it. And the problem is, of course, it's like all the laws at the moment. They're all on hold until we sort this blooming Brexit thing out. The, the probate law that was introduced recently has been on hold as well. And universal credit is dragging its, its feet, if you like, until it gets going. But, you know, it's there as, as part of the deal. Now, what's the, what's the point behind universal credit? Well, the whole point behind it was it was supposed to simplify the receipt of welfare benefits, state, state benefits, which is a good thing because they reckon that the, the existing situation was very complicated. And boy, it is. It's very complicated. And somebody might apply for several different welfare benefits to help them in their world. So they might need to provide universal credit, which is one amount of money, which is payable to people. So that's the whole point, really. Universal credit was going to be one um, amount um, payable to people. So, so what is universal credit? Where, where does it come from? What's it about? Well, first of all, they, they intended to limit the amount of money per household. Which is a good thing in a way, isn't it? A bit political, that one. Um, people people need these things. But they were supposed to limit the amount of uh, the claim per household. Um, and it was also designed to provide additional, additional extras to people that needed it. Um, so, for example, it's going to provide child care payments, that sort of thing. So the whole point was it, it was allowing, allowing the government to pay extra where needed as well. Um, but the important thing is it reduces the, the myriad of different benefits. It reduces various benefits or, or it gets rid of various benefits. And it's designed to cut out a number of benefits which are, are not national insurance based effectively. Now some benefits of course you get if you pay your national insurance. The whole point here is it was supposed to replace those that didn't. So you've got the old income support. Income support is the old one that is payable to people that just need extra money. And it's very means tested, of course. There's job seekers allowance. There's the job seekers that's given to people that don't have an NI record. And that was the one that comes under universal credit. Um, the employment and support allowance, the old incapacity benefit, as we used to call it. Employment support allowance, again, give to people who are too ill to work. Again, it's the non-NI one there as well. And tax credits. Tax credits, again, a non-NI requirement, and you've got child tax credits, and you've got working tax credits. Uh, universal credit is designed to replace those as well. Again, you get those without an NI record. And the last one really was housing benefits. Housing benefits, again, which are given to you without an NI record. So, so the NI thing is quite an important one. Whether that would be a question, I would definitely make sure that you, 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 you refer to the fact that the NI benefits are not included. In US credit. So you see, see what they try to do, try to simplify it. So, you know, you've got one benefit for non NI uh, benefits, and you've got other benefits which are required if you pay your national insurance. And that's pretty much it, really. Um, there's not a lot more to say about universal credit, except that, uh, you know, it's beginning to happen. Uh, whether it will come through completely doesn't, who knows what's going to happen. Um, I do think it's a good thing. I do think that mortgage and protection advisors should be aware of these things. I think you should have a knowledge of welfare benefits, particularly if you're in the equity release market. You definitely need a, a knowledge of welfare benefits because your your income or your equity release that you give to customers can offset the welfare benefits people are getting. Um, for, for a general mortgage a broker, of course, it's things like IPI, income protection insurance, it's life assurance that you sell. These things, you need to be aware that people will get that stuff from the state. Now, income protection, of course, is employment support allowance. Um, life assurance is life assurance, and people need that because there, there is um, um, life assurance available or assurance available to people who die from the state as well. So you've got to be aware of these things. And note that customer will get some of that if they're ill or die, 
but you need to be aware of what they're getting roughly so, so you know what you're talking about. Um, that's universal credit. Oh, that's been useful. Bye. There you go, just a, a quick one there for you on universal credit. Um, just be aware of the ones it replaces, really, is the key. Let's get that a bit of a rub out, and we'll see if we've got any more questions coming in. Otherwise, we're going to move on to our, our, our next subject. It's our last subject, so quite a, quite a small one today. There we go. Nothing coming through. Good, 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 good. Quick checking emails and things. Yeah, let's take a look at um, a sales prospecting idea for you, which I call 10 touch points, because I like the word 10. 10 got a good ring to it. I've got 10 touch points. There you go. Now, we're going to have a great Christmas this year. Looking forward to Christmas big time. Um, I love Christmas. I love Christmas Day. The whole thing's just fantastic. I love it where you get a lot of people around the table and you all tuck into the good old Christmas tucker. And uh, this year, we're thinking about purchasing a um, product. We talked about it last year, I've got around to it, which is called a food hostess. Now, for anybody that knows about food hostesses, what you do is you get this gadget that... Um, you, you, you can either put it on the table or you can get tables for it or legs for it. And the gadget allows you to keep food warm. Um, you can have an you know, electric plugged into it. So you put your, put your vegetables in there, your potatoes in there, and your carrots in there, whatever it is. And it keeps it warm. The whole point is you weave it in and it's all lovely and warm and people can tuck in when they want to. And if you want to spend 20 minutes you know, toasting the queen or whatever she want to do before you eat your food, then you can do that. Now, the whole point behind the, the, the hostess is that um, the, the, the metaphor is, is when it comes to prospecting. Because when you prospect for people, uh, modern sales funnels, so whatever it is your prospecting methodology that you're using, uh, we, we, we often call it a sales funnel, and you can call it that if you want to. A lot of people have an upside-down sales funnel, which actually is probably a better way of looking at it. So if you drew that upside-down, there you go. That's the old sales funnel, as we used to call it. Um, in other words, you, you bring in your prospects, however you do that, whatever your marketing is. <clears throat> and these prospects, of course, go down the funnel and eventually they start to go into your sales process and you can then start selling them and advising them. That's a very traditional sales funnel. Now, of course, things have changed a lot in that respect because no longer can you expect people to have your entire attention when you bring them into your fold. Um, what happens now, of course, though, is that you might make a, you know, you've targeted somebody, but you may not get in touch with them because of modern methods of communication. In the old days, when you just had the telephone and letters, people pretty much got your attention. But nowadays, you've got so many different ways of doing it. People often don't talk to you. I mean, I keep my mobile phone uh, on silent all the time, and um, I don't answer it because I don't just go straight to voicemail. Um, I sometimes pick up messages I very rarely do. If it's important, they'll phone back or they'll send me an email or whatever it is. But uh, the world has changed. So what happens, you see, somebody comes into your funnel, and we'll call it an upside-down funnel here for you. They come into your funnel, and what you need to do now is you need to touch them ten times before they get anywhere near your sales process. And it's these ten touch points that so you need to be flexible with. Let's give you some ideas about which ones you can do. Um, the first one you could do, if it's in the corporate world we're talking here, business to business, it could be consumers you're talking to as well, is you could invite them along a good old-fashioned webinar. Now, webinars are great things. Webinars are a good old-fashioned webinar. You could uh, get an expert in your business to come talk about something. Um, it could be somebody to talk about equity release, maybe. You could get one of the providers in to talk about it yourself, maybe. But invite your customers along. There'll be a number of customers you can invite to the webinar and see if they want to attend. If they don't attend, they can watch the replay. Very popular way of doing it. And as long as it's information rich and not a commercial, then I think you're okay. You're good to go for that one as well. Um, you could do some kind of showcase. You could do a presentation. Um, you could go along to a meeting and do a presentation to a group of people. You could do a showcase and invite them along to that. It could be online or offline as well. That's one way of doing it. Um, on the same basis, you could do an online video. You could do a video on, on the, the topic, whatever it is you're selling. Um, it could be features, benefits about a particular product or whatever it is. You could do a nice online video, maybe a cartoon-based video, whatever it's playing software that you can do that for now as well. Um, you could do a personalized video and send it to somebody. 
So rather than sort of general online one, do a personalised video. I've seen them on, 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 on LinkedIn. It depends on the quality. But you can send that to your prospect, who you are, what you do, what you're about. Just, you know, sub one minute might, might be quite nice to see a face. You can li link the video to Vimeo or, or pri private site somewhere and uh, send them a link to that. That's another way of doing it if you want to do it that way as well. Sometimes works as well. Um, you could do some writing. You could do a white paper. You could do some kind of um, product, written product you send to people. Now, I, I, I do a lot of writing. I'll show you an example of what I do here. Here's um, one that I published last week, uh, which is called The Trusted BDM, which is Business Development Manager. It's an article I wrote, uh, which uh, is a jolly good article too. And I got this company to print these all off for me. And I post these to people that are in my in my sales funnel, and they'll have a look at it hopefully, and, and they'll, they'll appreciate the fact that I know what I'm talking about, roughly, <laughs> and therefore they give me a call. Um, that's, that's again another way you could do it. So you could do lots of writing. You could write a white paper, an article, whatever it is you want to do. Let's change the color pen, the way as well. Um, get, get involved in LinkedIn. If LinkedIn is your bag, then get, get involved in LinkedIn. I've already linked in with three people this morning. It's only 10 o'clock here on a Monday. And this chap from, um, from UAE, in fact, United Arab Emirates, wants to come on an online course of mine in the autumn, which is great. Do a lot of my training online now. Uh, that's the way the world is moving. So typical workshop, but online. It's a full bank, and he's interested, so I um, emailed him back, but I went on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, we we'll start to talk by LinkedIn. I've already connected with a couple of people from the weekend on LinkedIn. If that's your bag, then use that one as well. It might well be another kind of social media that you have. It might be Twitter that you're looking to link in with people with. And it could be Facebook if you're in the, in, in the consumer market or Instagram, whatever, whatever is your preferred method of, uh, of social media. I mean, these things all work, don't they? Um, other couple of things you might want to do. You might want to produce some kind of podcast. Podcasts are great things. People listen to these things, of course. You could produce a podcast, put it on iTunes or whatever it is, one of the other methods, and get your prospect to connect to that and listen to your podcast. As long as your podcasts are interesting, they talk about your topic, your expertise. Don't be afraid of telling people everything. Tell people exactly how they want to do whatever it is they want to do. If they want to do it themselves, fine. But most people want to engage you to do it for them. That's the key thing of the modern world. Nobody has any knowledge that's alone anymore. Nobody's got knowledge in their head that nobody else has got. The internet's spread everything. It's democratised absolutely everything for you as well. And the, far, the last thing you want to do, I can look at 10 there for you, is um, you could even send them an email. There you go. That's a thought, isn't it? Emails still work. You can email people things if you want to, messages. LinkedIn email also works particularly well. Uh, if it's a business to business setting. So these things are you like know, 10 touch points. The whole point behind them is that you um, use them. You use them to, to send people information. The email could be a, a weekly one. I, I have three or four weekly emails I send to people. One on Sunday night, one on Monday night, one on Tuesday night. Um, I get emails from my, my corporate um, people I buy from. Um, I'll get one from the other day. Three flag who do my breakdown cover. They're pretty cool. They always send emails about latest sort of driving ideas, you know, how to drive in the ice, for example, what to do in the sudden heat, how to make sure you regas your um, your air conditioning system. They actually provide you with useful information, which is why I like them as well. So that's something to think about as well. Um, yeah, that's my Christmas list. It's a um, shopping or a food hostess. If you want to get me a food hostess for Christmas, I'll be very happy with that one. I also put on my list um, a gadget that checks for wires behind walls. I've got a new screwdriver set as well. Uh, what, what to buy for a man in his mid-50s. <laughs> it's a difficult one, isn't it? I hope you found that useful. I did too. Bye. There you go, a little sales tip there for you. hope that's been of use to you. Okay, can't see any questions coming down. A quick check over there, Granny. No, can't see any coming down. So we're going to clock off now. See you again next week. Got some more topics for you on our live stream. Hopefully you can start to join us on a regular basis. Ask questions beforehand if you want to. If you're on the boot camps, just send me the questions. I'll put these on the system for you and we'll get more recorded for you. Hopefully you have a great week. Uh, enjoy the summer. See you soon. Bye. Ha <laughs> ha.